Ten years is a long time, for anything really. But there's very little we'd have done differently. Maybe taken more photos. We've been amazing places and met some of the worst of people. We've been some terrible places and found absolute kindness and prosperity. By now people will know that being in a band isn't glamorous. I'm not even that sure that it ever was. It's hard work and it's tiring. The road can be a lonely place and the guilt of pursuing a long forgotten dream endures like the sound of broken teeth in a rattle. But we're doing it, whatever it is, and for that I'm proud. As for many, indeed most, life can be one long preparation for something that never happens. People often ask if it's like a family, but it's something else. Her name is Kala, is my muse, my mistress, my parasite. It'll be with me long after our final curtain call, because it's who I am, it's who we are, and I'll let it kill me, and I'll let it devour me. For all things will kill you, both slowly and fast, but it's much better to be killed by something that you love. The very first time I ever saw Tom play was because I wanted to get with a girl and he convinced me that a girl was going to a gig to see him do an acoustic show. Um, but no, the longevity of the band was just the fact that I was in another band at the time, he wasn't in a band, so I just kind of played with him for a bit and then um, then he had a band called Mercurial and I joined them and then that band kind of fell apart because they wanted to do more kind of rock stuff and Tom was more, wanted to do sort of, sort of like singer songwriter stuff but not traditional style of music, not like rock or folk, not, not fitting into a category. While I was at uni I started putting gigs on and uh, Tom and Mike um, together with some other folks had a band called Mercurial uh, who, were, who were great, it was, it was kind of balls out, alternative, kind of rocky sort of, sort of stuff, so I put them on a few times. Um, and then got wind that Tom and Mike had set up this much more stripped back acoustic, you know, acoustic guitar, much more mellow kind of outfit. Uh, with this drummer called uh, Scott um, and I, they were playing at uh, this kind of all day thing that they were doing at the Orange Tree pub in town uh, and I went along and got drunk and said I want to be in your band and they said all right but yeah we'd, we'd, do, we'd play these festivals and Tom, me and Tom were playing just me on bass and Tom on acoustic guitar and singing and we would just jam out some songs song, Tom would, song, would know the songs but Tom would just go off and freestyle and we've just learned to be really tight as a, the two of us playing where I just just by kind of observing each other play like mid song we could know what each other was doing a bit like a, a telepathy kind of thing and then from there we thought we had something good but we didn't want to call ourselves Mercurial because that was the old band and then Tom had written this song I think he'd written a song called Her Name Is Calla and I was like oh, that's a good name for a band name I don't know if he's going to remember that was my idea, but yeah, whatever. It might not be in the, in the history of it all. But um, yeah, so that was a, the idea for it first. Well, then we got a drummer who came and gone, and then we finally got this drummer called Andy Coles, and he he kind of stuck with it. He was close good. He was more of a, a metal drummer, but he kind of really broadened our sound. But the whole idea of what we the big scheme of things was always just to kind of just to get a sound that we really liked, get a sound we had our own sound that we had and just to try and keep with that and persevere with it and people said they liked it and more people started coming to gigs that kind of thing and we got Tom Core in playing the trombone and doing some electrical stuff as well. From kind of when I joined we went into this kind of no drums kind of weird thing and I was I, I wasn't just playing trombone or I think I did a little bit of trombone but I was mostly there just with kind of four or five effects pedals and doing feedback loops through them and just making fairly unpredictable noises in the corner 
uh, while Tom and Mike <laughs> played these nice acoustic uh, songs. Um, but, I, you know, I stayed in the band and it kind of worked out. When Mike and me started off, it was like just, just a couple of guys just playing whatever came, whatever came to us. Whatever came first. Whatever came, yeah. But um, then when we started maybe taking it more seriously and getting a couple of other guys, then I think that's when we kind of lost our little uh, individuality and we, we started actively pulling in influences. Um, and then I think we realised that that is dependent on the people that you're playing with, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and we we moved away from those people naturally, anyway. And then um, I think it's one of the hardest things about being a band is like finding the right people to play with and the right people that uh, are good for the band, but. Um, yeah, um, but when we first started, n none of this had ever really crossed our minds. It was literally, let's just jam some songs, yeah. man. Because like ten years ago, I would have been nineteen. I was all I cared about was losing my virginity. Yeah. But <laughs> 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 now I joined uh, the band like uh, like four or five years into it. Like when I was like twenty three, twenty four, and I'd just left uh, uni and realised I had no life skills that meant the world could sustain me. Because mm. you said like you, you said it's like about thirty seconds ago that it's quite hard to find the right people to be in a band with. I just turned mm. up. Like I got two emails that week from two popular Leicester bands. One from her name is Kana, One from another band that I won't name. Um, asking if I wanted to play drums with them. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I listened to her name her name is Kana stuff. Didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> it's like well, this is a bit drawn out. What are you what are you even doing? But then I think I saw the video uh, for White in the Skin, and I really liked that. And I figured it, it looked like it would be more fun. <laughs> A lot of uh, there's a lot of bands that like play songs one particular way, and they and that's you know works for them, and that's fine. But um, for us, the uh, the human element is like one of the the most important parts of her name is Kala. Um, people who uh, play in the band have to. Be human. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Or an element. No lizard. This is boron. <laughs> yeah, we're anti-lizard. <laughs> uh, no, but we. Um, they have to bring, like, a part of themselves, to the songs, and I think that's something that's. Something that's maybe like quite, overlooked, but something that is. I think is incredibly important um, to be like an interesting and developing band and everybody who has come and played with us even if they only played like a couple of gigs have always brought something. Well perhaps more than most bands Her Name Is Kala have a lot of these kind of comings and goings of, of people both in terms of long time members and guest appearances as well um, which, is, which is really nice um, and the, the effect that it has well, the, what effects does it have on the people? I don't, I don't know really. I I left and and got more of a career to support my child, but you know, different people enter the band and leave the band for different reasons. But I think the effect on the music is is quite striking. Um, so, for example, when the um, first drummer left, uh, Scott and Andy joined. Andy was much more coming from a, a kind of a rock and heavy background. And then that came through into the music. Um, and some of the material that we wrote then that, that kind of 
found its way onto the heritage and some of the stuff we were playing live at that time really kind of started kicking off and developing beyond the more kind of acoustic guitar based stuff that the band had been doing before that. Um, and then the change of drummer to Adam, um, he carried on with the established material but then introduced uh, a kind of a more intricate complex way of playing and the multi-instrumental capacity of Adam as well um, brought in things um, instrumentally that led down a different path. So I think that the introduction of different members, particularly those drummers, I think, has really uh, driven the direction of the band, not in completely different ways, it's still the same, her name is Kala, but you can see these shifts in the music that's going through to the point now where there's this vast body of work that's really, really diverse. For us, like the songs like develop and change over time, and, um, and they always will do, and in our opinion, always should do. Yeah, so everybody who's 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 had a part in her name is Kala have like basically shaped it. There's a really lovely interview with you when I first joined the band, which I found the other day. When I first, I finally Googled myself. I normally Google Wiki, never Adam Wiker. And there's an interview, and you're like, and Adam joined the band. I think it really, you know, saved it and brought it back. And I was like, yeah, damn right, save this turd ship. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mess before me. Uh, uh, actually, we were getting a lot more press before you joined. Oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> I, I was. I am not good for press. <laughs> I don't know. I, I was. I always thought Kala was. If you break, a, if you have a Kala song as a pie chart, it breaks into thirds. You have the lyrics, which Tom Morris writes and sings, which are which are fantastic, but they give you part of a, a picture. They don't give you the whole picture, and then. The music is another third, and that adds another picture, another flavour to what's going on, the atmosphere of the song, and that kind of thing. And then the, the I was going to say the third quarter, the third third is kind of is you, the listener, and what you put into the song, um, so that the song is made up of. Well, is it, it, Tom figure out about something? You kind of figure out what it is, and you'll make it personal to you. And then with the song, help the song will build up and make atmosphere and will kind of take you on an emotional journey. You know that got really, really quite frustrating because it. it well, I, I don't know how people term it now, but certainly for the most part of while in the I was in the band, uh, generally post rock was the label that was applied, and so we ended up playing gig after gig after gig with kind of two or three like actual post rock bands, which and you know that's fine in moderation I think but it got a bit tiring after a while you know hours and hours and hours of, uh, of detailed time signatures and repeated riffs and things and that's not what colour is you know it's more folk than post rock really you know there the are beautifully sung and, and lyricised songs at the core of everything and yeah a lot of it might be instrumental probably you know, go back a while, more of it was than, than is now. But always at the core of it was, was kind of this lovely vocal and the, the lyrics that, that Tom writes. So, uh, yeah, I don't think post-rock really hit it on the head. I don't think we ever really worked out what what did, to be honest. At one point I feel like we tried to distance ourselves because we were yeah. in this long grass and it's like, it's just banjo and sadness. Whatever and we do, it's post-rock with, and it's with vocals. Yeah, also. yeah, yeah, and it's under 10 minutes. So it's not post rock, but um, we, st we st I think we've been. I, I, I think it's just the shadow of Condon River. Yeah. But that was the song that people knew, California. Like, even before I joined, it was like, when it's cast and everything we do now is post rock. But I don't. There's, there's no. There's never a conscious effort to be that. You know, we've written short poppy songs like like more and which run deep. 
and when we did long grass and stuff we got a few reviews that said we were like Shearwater and me and Tom were like oh who's this like we, we checked it out and we're like I love this so we're discovering bands through the comparisons that we've <laughs> been made and then <laughs> like, we're like oh yeah, this is really really cool um, but yeah but post rock is always one that I do I do like but I don't actively like we don't try and sound like anything I don't yeah. think in terms of the, the, the generic like uh like a lot of people come up to us and say like, oh, you like Godspeed? And it's like, nope, I, I completely don't like that kind of music. It has no influence upon like how we write a song. And we're happy to go in, in, in any direction possible. Like a lot of the writing process is like, Tom will send us these two stems of his vocal and his guitar. And then I'll be like, oh, I want to add saw and theremin and, and, pian and piano and, and drums, whatever to this. And I'll send it to you and we'll bounce it back and forth. And then you'll be like, oh, this bit needs more tenderness. So you, you'll sing on it and things like that. It's 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 not a conscious decision. Like we're not like aspiring to be like these bands we don't listen to. Uh, it, it it's just somehow how it pans out. Touring with Callow was definitely an experience. Um, very different from anything else I've done with uh, any other band. Um, they're not being diplomatic here. They're not the most organised of people, but somehow everything works out, and I'm not really sure uh, how that happens. Um, drunk uh, a lot. Um, probably the closest to sort of like. In a weird way, the closest to like rock and roll behaviour that I've ever experienced of any band, but in a sort of um, uh, understated uh, kind of nerdy rocker way. I mean, I have to be a bit honest about this. I mean, I've, I've only been in the band really about a year, and whilst I have had a European tour with them, um, I don't really have the. Uh, I suppose I don't have the benefit of, of the experiences of kind of the, the wide range of touring that they have done. But um, European fans, and this sounds like such a wanky thing to say, and I, I mean no discredit to, to, to UK fans at all, but um, it's, it's unusual because they'll travel. They'll travel um, to, you know, not just kind of within the kind of the country or within the city, they'll, they'll, they'll travel to other countries, you know. And um, when we were, um, we played some mainline Europe shows in in uh, November last year, and there's one guy and, and his girlfriend, and they came to three of them, spanning Switzerland, um, Switzerland, Netherlands, and and Belgium, and he's from Spain. And I thought like no one would ever do this in the UK. I mean, well, maybe people do, but I don't know them, and I just think that people are. It's not. I'm not. I I don't know whether or not they just. Uh, you know, they're more grateful that kind of bands are prepared to, you know, to go and tour in, in Europe or they just are more kind of into it. I, I don't know, but it blew my mind that I kept seeing the same face at shows every day. And, um, you know, then you, you talk to them, obviously, and they're really, really nice guys. I think Scotland as a whole really appreciate us playing and really, really supportive, really friendly. Especially when you went all the North Scotland, to, well, not North Scotland, but to Aberdeen, they really appreciate us there. But in in Europe, we played. Um, I think after the tsunami happened, I think we did a on eBay. Calla did an auction thing where you could get them to play in your home, and some guy in France bought us. I think for two, like 150 euros, 200 euros to play a gig in his garage, and we got there, and it was his mate's birthday, and his mate was a fan of the band. Literally, he was playing a gig to like 10 people, but we travelled all the way into the middle of middle of. God knows where in fucking France, playing a gig in someone's shed, in someone's big garage. But then that the fact that he he did he liked the band so much he would do that was fantastic. The fact that the next day we had to drive for thirty hours to get to Berlin was a bit of a downer. But but that was just that was quite a special moment. I thought the last couple of shows of the tour we did with I Like Trains, when we'd all kind of relaxed a little bit and everyone was more kind of into the groove. <laughs> me particularly, I was like living on the edge. Um, 
that was really good fun. Uh, touring with them was a great experience. But uh, you were saying Bono? Bono, is that you pronounce uh, it? Bono in Czech Republic for me is a, like a real special town. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel really welcome there. Like, yeah. really welcome. They, um, for me, it's like the best music town on a tour. Um, the times we've played there, like we've got a great promoter there, like a really cool guy who is like so passionate about music and having a good time which is also good uh but also like the people like every like that it, it's almost like like the whole town turns up for a gig or the whole town that like are interested in that type of the music. mayor's there fucking massive chain <laughs> rattling at the front <laughs> not quite but um no it's just like loads of people come to the gig and um We've just always, we, we've played there as a band like three, four times. I've played there solo twice, I think. Um, but it's like the room's always packed. It's like a real, I mean, the the venue that we've played there, I mean, the venue's gone now, sadly. We're playing at a new place. But the, the venue we used to play at, it's not like a, a great venue. It's like a real shitty, inner basement, sweaty, dark, dank place and the sounds like not great but it was just like really cool like the, the, like the people there were just so into the music you know they're all shouting the lyrics back at you and things like that it's just like one of the and not every town's like that at all no so you're thinking about a, some kind of standout moment the the, the kind of being in color the it's it's just like a torrent of moments so it's hard to pick one out, but there's there's one weird thing that keeps coming back to me, um, and it's it's not as though it was anything that was any more fun or any more dangerous or any more drunken or something to be proud of than anything else. So I don't know why it keeps coming back to me. Um, but we played a gig in Oxford, and this is um, and this was in the big black van that we had, the old Renault Master. Um, and we were just, uh, it was after the gig, we were driving back um, and we saw a couple by the side of the road. So we opened up the slide or the side and hoiked them in and off we went. And so there's just this little story of kidnapping the, this couple. I can't remember what happened in the van and then we chucked them out, we drove them home and chucked them out. So it was a very civilised kidnapping. But the, uh, I don't know, something about that maybe resonates with uh, the kind of overall experience with, with Kala and the way that it's just... You know, it's not, despite the music, it's not all serious all the time, doom and gloom kind of thing, which I think is what a lot of people might might think, that, that that's really balanced by this kind of carefree and fun-loving and kind of meeting people and getting them involved while on the road. Yeah, I think Tom really injured himself just after that when he tried to vault back into the van, landed on the table and broke it. <laughs> I mean, it's it sounds uh, almost... <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's no, wait, almost... I'll tell them. <laughs> Guys, I'm trying here. <laughs> I think it's the sense of seriousness that we bring. <laughs> uh, um, and no, it does sound a little bit trite, but um, um, and it, I suppose it sounds like a kind of a blog or the back of Just 17 magazine, but it's the friendship and the traveling, I think, that for me are the, the two best things. That I mean, it's you kind of. You, you start a band and um, you know kind of like unwittingly or unknowingly somehow you've kind of you've made best friends with three or four people and you almost don't see it coming and um, you, but then you couldn't see a life without them and you know I've been in a number of bands and you know I've been very lucky in the bands that I've been in that everyone's been really sound and really nice but I don't know if I've ever felt as comfortable with three other adults as I have done in this band I've spent weeks with these people in the back of a van and and I do it again in a heartbeat and and that's the side of it you know like getting to travel I think is, is another really big thing for me because you get to see you get to see parts of the world you wouldn't necessarily go to see you get to go to parts of the world you wouldn't necessarily want to go to and uh, you have you know but you you get to go to them regardless and you see you see a side of the city sometimes that you know, we were in Barcelona recently and, you know, like whilst there was kind of the, you know, all the things you have to see, kind of, you know, the, the you know, the Gaudi Cathedral and so on. And all, 
we didn't do any of that, um, but we had a you know a great time. Yeah, it's you know there's, there's there's so many great things about being in a band, but you know, gun to my head, probably camaraderie and travel. Just couldn't agree more. It's, it's it's a weird sort of friendship and family and weird intimacy all rolled into one. <laughs> Everyone knows what each of us thinking and. It, the company you spend together is just so much fun and so intense all the time. One, one of the th most standout moments of of being in... Well, so, so, there are many along, dotted along the way. Um, like when we when Condon River first got its release and the success of that and how in interest gathered from that and then how we got a fallen single, A Moment of Clarity, and that came out in vinyl, and that, it, although the vinyl didn't, didn't sell very well, but having, getting that package with your vinyl record on it and being pressed by someone, a professional pressing, is such a kind of like, holy fucking shit, we've, we've made it. We've well, not made it, but you know, we've, we've done something that somebody else has paid for. Because along uh, before that point, everything you do, you're paying for hand over fist, and you're not getting any, any money back from it. And this is something that someone's got enough faith in, faith in us to spend 400, 500 pounds pressing a record. And that was really impressive. For me, it's uh, The Heritage, uh, the first record, because it was... Uh, that was where Adam was coming in to the... Uh, he, he was joining us about then. And, and it was just like the record where we really found our like identity, I guess. Groove. Uh, our groove, yeah. Um, but it, it's that record where, um, I mean, it's not the best that we've like played or the best songs or anything like that. But it was that it was that moment when we were doing that where everything started coming together and we realised what the band was um, and how the band should be. And moving forward, it wasn't. It's got nothing to do with the songs or the process. It's just that time, like that period of time where where we just it was just like uh, we were just like you know some guys like playing music in the basement, and we were we were trying to you know work out how to kind of record and capture our songs but we were really just doing it for ourselves you know absolutely just doing it for us and all color records are like that we, it's just for ourselves but you know we're just lucky that other people wanted to hear them as well um, but for me that is um, your moment I, I mean I've done a lot of solo stuff as well but for me that record is the most important thing that I've mm. musically that I've ever done kind of when when I was sort of given this sort of task of you know like you know when you know when I discussed joining the band with Adam um actually joining this band was one of the easiest things I've ever done because you know whilst I had to learn how to play the songs I already knew them like Jason Newstead when he joined Metallica in 1980 he was exactly yeah, the same yeah. he just he was just a big fan of the band who knew all of the songs so all it really was just a matter of getting up to speed and that's what I mean for me and because I can't talk about the same sort of level of kind of um, longevity or you know I can't dis really discuss I the, just thought you I, I just moments. thought that you'd packed in playing music really <laughs> so we'd never asked you because I was like he's got a real job now I do have and a he's real job it, and he's bought a house <laughs> and he's married he's like he, he's not interested anymore but uh, no it was you know, I was oh, it's, so. I suppose to me, joining the band is for me the kind of the most. That's my standout moment. You know, it's, it's best be, thing we ever did was getting this guy involved. But being a part of something that I admire so much is 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 a really kind of you know, it's it's a hugely kind of important thing to me. And there will be there'll be great moments for me yet to come. Do you 